even though there's a little part of me that says, oh, you ought to bite your tongue here, I really should bite my tongue when my brain is in. They're adults now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to find that middle ground. They don't want advice. Learning to say no. Called it shredded tongue syndrome. Bite your tongue. <laughs> we all need smiles these days because of the masks we're wearing so much. <laughs> we're, we're not our parents' generation in that one. Was I disappointed? Yes, I have to be honest. I think it's very important as grandparents that you have... Welcome to the Bite Your Tongue podcast. I'm Denise, and I'm joined by my good friend, Dr. Ellen Broughton. We've been through many years of parenting together, and now we're ready to talk about the ins and outs of parenting adult children. Your diapering days are over. Now it's time to consider when to bite your tongue. So let's get started. Welcome to the season one finale of Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. Thank you so much to all our listeners who joined us for this journey. I'm Denise Gorant, and I'm here with my on-again, off-again co-host, Ellen Broughton. So, Ellen, we're wrapping up season one. This is actually episode 19. Did you ever think we'd get here? I just can't believe it, Denise, but you know what? I'm really not that surprised. You had a great idea for a podcast, a topic that hasn't been discussed much until now. How can we continue to be good parents after our kids become adults? Absolutely. And today, Ellen, we're raising a glass to our behind-the-scenes software engineer, Connie Fisher. Connie has created the most wonderful mashup of all of our episodes. She picked the pearls of wisdom of each episode and put them together in a fun, fast-moving pace. I really think everyone will love this. Oh, I loved it too. And thanks so much, Connie. I hope everyone listening hears something that sparks their interest so that they visit the website and tune in for the entire episode. I particularly love the episode on spirituality with Elizabeth and Galit. I think it was episode six. I practically memorized the wedding episode since my daughter's getting married this summer. And I have to secretly admit that I took notes on the one about grandparenting because, well, I'm hoping I'm going to need them someday. Oh, Ellen, that's hysterical. And those are good ones that you mentioned, Ellen. I actually really love the interview with Dr. Susan Heitler, and I practiced so many of her suggestions on our family vacation. I also learned a, quite a bit from Levi on the LGBTQ episode, and I really love talking to Dr. Beth Cookson when we discuss mental health. But before we hit play, I just want to say how much fun I've had doing this with you. I know you were writing your book and not able to be with me for every episode, and I think that will continue for season two. I'm actually thinking about bringing some guest hosts in for a few episodes like I did with Connie. It always helps to get a new perspective. Thanks again, Ellen. It's been a great ride. Oh my gosh, Denise, I've had so much fun too. It was so nice to reconnect and talk about parenting again. You know, we started this conversation when our grown daughters were in diapers. And it showed me that maintaining the mom friendships that began when our children were infants and preschoolers continue to be important as we move into different stages of our lives. You know, I've learned a lot through this season that parenting adults is complicated. It's complicated by identity. It's complicated by religion, spirituality, sexuality, and relationships, not just our relationships with them, but our relationships with the other people in their lives and ours too. And really, pretty importantly, the relationship we have to ourselves. So thanks so much for including me, Denise. And listeners, we hope you enjoy Bite Your Tongue. We'll be back in January. Happy New Year. Ellen, you really summed it up well. And I do hope I get that book done someday so that I can actually be back. Absolutely. You know, I'd always love to have you. But for now, I hope our listeners enjoy this wonderful compilation of season one of Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. Author Amanda Morin, who just released a book called Adulting Made Easy. If you are raising kids, if you've raised kids, you know that there are some years in there where it's just, it is really hard to make it through the teenage years where they think they know everything, you know nothing, and then it sort of switches back around again. But I also think part of raising them to be successful adults was raising them to know that they had to be adults, right? And to me, that was a really important part of it is making sure that they knew that while I was still there, they really had to start doing things on their own and to make their own decisions 
whether they're good ones or bad ones, right? To know that those are their decisions to make. I have learned the power of the phrase, you don't owe me an explanation. And the flip side of that is, I don't owe you an explanation, right? That kind of a thing. So that phrase, you don't owe me an explanation. When my young adults are telling me about decisions they made or how they're spending their money, you know, and they, it sometimes sounds like they're trying to justify it to me. And I'm just like, you don't owe me an explanation. It's yours to do. That's great. You know? And sometimes I have learned to say to, you know, that's a choice I wouldn't have made, but I support you in making that choice. Those are things I have learned by doing it so badly and having such bad experiences and, and, and trying to get our way out of these, these moments that I had to learn new ways to have those conversations. We can provide all of those tools that we think our young adults need, but also know they're going to fail at some point, and that's not our fault. It's actually a learning experience and it needs to happen. And then the second takeaway is that I have learned the hard way that sometimes, if an, even if there's a little part of me that says, Oh, you ought to bite your tongue here, I really should bite my tongue when my brain is saying that. But today we're welcoming Jeff Updike. Let's just call it finances and your adult kids. The boomers spend money like it's going out of style. They wanted to, they were the ones that wanted to keep up with the Joneses. And I don't think Gen X is like that at all. Gen X is a much different generation. I see too much of that in a lot of the boomers that I that I dealt with when I was writing my column that I hear from today who don't have enough money saved because they've spent it all along the way on buying this house and in the, the second house and in the third house and this car, and then the Suburban, and I, I, I just don't think boomers are a financially literate group. And I know there's a lot of boomers who are going to get mad at me saying that, but that's my perspective as a financial writing ta- writer talking to them for 20 years. So many people around us are paying for the kids' car insurance, paying for half of their rent, paying for their deductibles. What are the steps for us to get them to live completely financially independent? Nancy Reagan said it best. Just. Say no. <laughs> there's no other. There's no other simple answer. I mean, it is as simple as learning to say no. Take a stand for yourself. Take a stand for your future. Take a stand for your own retirement. Take a stand for your own wallet, and say no. If you can't afford to give your child something, if you think they should deserve, they think they should earn it for themselves, then make that stand and say no. Tomorrow's adults need as much financial education as they could possibly have, because the economy we're moving into in America is not going to be a very good economy, despite what's going on right now. And you've got, you know, job growth, all that kind of stuff that's happening. We're moving into a world that's going to be filled with a lot of hurt, honestly. And kids need to understand now how best to manage their money, how best to invest. Today for Mother's Day, I want to celebrate two mothers I've admired for many years. They are real parents of adult children who I believe we all can learn from. Welcome to Doria, a parent of three girls. And welcome to Sharon, who is a mother of two girls and one set of twin girls, so four all together. Still holds true as adults, too. They need hugs. We need hugs. They need, you know, a smile. We all need smiles these days because of the masks we're wearing so much. (laughs) Those are the kinds of things that are really, they translate throughout our relationship and the time that we have together. You know, Sharon, I, we have girls. I pull my girls onto my lap every time I see them because they're always your children. And, and, you know, sometimes there's giggles and, but they love it. Even though most of them, all three of them are bigger than me, but pulling them onto your lap and and just confirming that strong, loving bond that you have is never gets old. I freely give my opinion, but I try very hard not to have the opinion feel like a judgment. The difference is, this is what I think about it. What do you think about it? And that's the most important part to me. But I think there's really a distinct difference between passing on a judgment of your behavior and an opinion about what you see. Finding those 
little minutia of life that is so important. It doesn't have to be big major topics about how's that job going and, you know, it, are you are, are you able to pay your bills or things like that, <laughs> although those are important, but also just the little things. How are you feeling today? And with girls, they're like, Mom, what, what are you wearing? You know? <laughs> so just touching base and we're all alive right now and just make the moment special, even if it's a two-minute phone call. Make it happy and special. So today we are beyond excited, especially I am beyond excited to welcome Allie Houston Lyons. She is a therapist at Isle Talk, a boutique therapy practice that specializes in helping the modern day bride or groom cope with the stresses of planning a wedding. I, I think that your first step as a family is to give the engagement space to breathe and to encourage that in your child. So a lot of times people get engaged and they want to rush straight into wedding planning, which really means rushing straight into stress and also quickly replaces the idea and the importance of the marriage itself with the idea of the wedding. Um, to be blunt, engagements are sold by society as all sex and champagne, which they are in part. So in an ideal world, they are lots of sex and lots of champagne. And I hope I'm not turning off the parents listening no, to this. No, thinking no, no, about- no, don't worry. No, 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 no. We, we, we're, 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 we're not that. our parents' generation in that way. <laughs> we're the cool moms. We're the cool moms, right? <laughs> 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 Today, we're pleased to welcome Chris Burbank for an episode on parenting your adult children with special needs. Chris is a coach for families with disabilities and works not only with families with adult children, but with all ages. The first thing I have found is that you can't plan if you don't name it and acknowledge it. For some of us, we brought the baby home from the hospital and we knew right away that there were going to be special challenges. For other parents, we don't find that out. And it's it's a hard pill to swallow. And so I think early on, parents are really fixated on understanding their kids and setting high expectations. And if there are challenges, you know, they're they're getting tutors or they're getting therapists or they're finding special programs. And, you know, at some point, and and every child is different, at some point parents, I think, start to recognize this is who my child is, just like, uh, just like with our, our, our typical kids. And that's when we have to start to accept that and begin to plan. Um, I do believe that I am a much better person, and I'm going to try not to cry when I say this, um, for um, the experiences that I have had with my son and with all of the people that I have met because of my son. Having said that, it is hard. It is complex. And you asked, how do you get a break? You don't get a break unless you recognize that you deserve a break and that you need a break and that you cannot care for other people unless you care for yourself. Hi, everybody. Today we're talking about spirituality and religion and our adult young children. Joining us for this discussion are two amazing women. First, let me introduce a dear friend, the Reverend Elizabeth P. Randall. Elizabeth is the rector at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Denver. She's been happily married for over 30 years to someone who is Jewish. Together, they have one daughter. Ellen, why don't you introduce our second guest? I'd like to introduce Galit Gottlieb. Galit, who practices conservative Judaism, served as a synagogue cantor for many years. She's also a very talented musician and an author, as well as a mother and a wife of a Jewish scholar. So their, their significant others are all of different faith. I think each of my children thought long and hard about their paths. And I think it, it might have been easier for them had they managed to find Jewish partners. But here's the thing. They each found an incredibly kind-hearted, sweet-natured, good person to fall in love with. I, I remember my daughters asking me questions like when they were younger, like, would you would you prefer for me to marry a really good person who happens to be Christian or a selfish, bitter Jewish person? 
I would say like, are those my only choices? <laughs> are those your only choices? <laughs> oh, was I disappointed? Yes, I have to be honest. I, I was disappointed that they didn't choose the path I wanted them to, but, but who am I to dictate what path they chose? This is where I'm similar to Galit by looking at uh, values and actions and saying, are they congruent with what I believe are characteristic of a life of meaning? which for me is deeply connected to my spirituality, but, but I think I really understand that that's simply not true for everybody and that you can live an ethical, meaningful, compassionate life without a religious practice. Welcome, Dr. Susan Heitler. She's a renowned relationship therapist, the author of several books, and she teaches collaborative communication. When you're building a connection with somebody, you're sitting out to dinner, the phone rings, that's an interruption. When you come back to the conversation, the intimacy level, the sense of connection will go back to the beginning or at least back significantly from where it was when the phone rang. So instead of building an ever closer relationship, instead of building on conversations, you're one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back with each interruption. They're adults now. At the same time, if you find a tactful way to bring it up so that you're talking about you, not them is the key, or talking about the topic in general, not them. I'll give an example. Okay. Gee, I read a magazine article about the different spending patterns in the, your generation versus my generation. I'm really curious what your thoughts are about that. The more you get them to talk, the better. Okay. That makes sense. And then again, whatever they say, the customer is always right. Agree and add. Agree and add. We're all going to have to practice right. this. <laughs> Today we're talking about LGBTQ, both in general and for parents of adult LGBTQ children. Today we have two people I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the last two weeks. Let's welcome Levi Tichi, the president of the board of directors of PFLAG Denver, and Stacy Shigaya, who is the PFLAG Denver board secretary. I just wanted to, to clarify that PFLAG stands for Parents, Family, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And uh, nowadays, we just go by PFLAG. And there are over 300 chapters around the country. They, there are also uh, chapters outside the United States. And that's really important for places where uh, the LGBTQ community is discriminated against even more so than in the United States, where it's actually a crime to be part of the community. So to have these types of organizations that support people just being themselves is really important. And, you know, Jean Manford was the mom who marched in a gay parade with her son and, and was the beginning of PFLAG in 72 and said, uh, like Levi said, you know, this is my son. I, I support my son regardless. If you're a parent and you have a, a child that comes to you and speaks their truth, you reject that truth on whatever basis it is that you decide it's false, you're going to alienate that child. You know, I understand that we need, as an adult children, and Denise, I know that your podcast is specifically targeted to parents of adult children. But once again, we're still your children, even when we are adults, and you are still the authority in our lives, even into our adulthood, even to I'm, I'm in my late 30s now. I have never found a substitute for my father's voice. Today, we welcome Dr. Larry Nelson. He is actually the president of SSEA and a professor in the School of Family Life at Brigham Young University. He's most interested in the factors that contribute to flourishing and floundering during emerging adulthood. 
And as parents, frankly, so are we. Well, as I started to study this transition to adulthood and, and emerging adults, which again, the time period is 18 to 29, and we can discuss that a little bit, but I, I found myself really enjoying studying this. And I asked myself why, and it just dawned on me. I'm like, ah, because they're just big preschoolers again, meaning just as those early years kind of set the trajectory for the school years, childhood and adolescence, what young people do in the third decade of life sets the trajectory for what comes next, positive or negative. Wow. And that's why I became so fascinated by the time period and why I consider emerging adults just big preschoolers. There's a biological component. We know that the brain uh, isn't fully developed until, on average, the mid-20s. So if you picture this combination now that we are telling 18-year-olds, here, you have all this autonomy to make decisions for yourself, but there's no structure for them anymore. They move from a time period as children and adolescents to where their entire day has some structure, school, coaches, employers, to now there's autonomy to spend their time how they want and with whom they want. So again, autonomy, lack of structure, and a brain that isn't fully developed. So is it any wonder that we see the early 20s as the peak period in the entire lifespan for any number of problematic behaviors? When we started this podcast, many listeners asked if we could hear from some young adults. Let's learn more about this stage of life from them. Well, today's the day. I twisted the arm of two wonderful young adults, both in their early 30s. Dan grew up in Vermont and now lives near New York City. Sarah grew up in Denver, and she's a professional living in Denver. If your parents did not like your significant other, you're dating someone and they just think, oh my gosh, what the heck is she thinking? What the heck is he thinking? Would you like them to tell you? And if so, how? <laughs> you know, I actually did have my mom tell me once that she didn't like someone I was dating. I had been dating some this person for a couple of months and invited them to go to dinner when my sister was visiting in town. After dinner, I did ask her, what did you think of him? And she said, I don't really think you guys are a good fit. And obviously, I was kind of shocked. It bothered me that she didn't approve of him or didn't really like him that much, because obviously, I liked him at the time and was hoping that she would feel the same way. You know, she gave me that feedback because I asked for it. So it didn't just come out of nowhere. And I, you know, obviously I expected her to be honest and she was. And was she right? And was she right? Yeah, I think she was right. You know, I, it bothered me that she had said that and it made me think a little bit more. And eventually I realized like, yeah, this, this isn't a good fit. So there's some reckless behavior in your 20s. Um, Dan, why don't you go to that one first? <laughs> With the, if you guys could see their faces, I wish you could. Big smiles. I mean, reckless behavior, I feel like, just sums up your early 20s. <laughs> but I'll let Dan go. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I smoked a lot of weed. I drank quite a bit. I had definitely a ton of opportunities to wreck the rest of my life. Um, if, you know, I think luck plays a big part of it. But yeah, I mean, as far as like having parents that are there to try and guide you, I'm sure it's, it's, it can't be an easy task. I can't even tell you today, I'm just beyond excited to welcome Julie Dolan Smith. Most people know, know her as Julie Dolan because her alter ego is Urban Nana on the legendary podcast, The Satellite Sisters. So Ellen's going to do a quick introduction to Julie, and then we're going to start, okay? So first of all, I'm so excited to hear what you have to say, but I'm almost as excited to hear Denise 
be excited because <laughs> I asked her today, I, I said, do, have you really been listening to this for 20 years? And she said, yes, I have. So um, <laughs> she's quite starstruck and it's very wonderful. But I'll have to tell you as part of my urban Nana persona, I always have mints in my pocketbook. Okay. <laughs> That's just kind of one of my, yeah, I think it's very important important as grandparents that you have some signature moves, okay, that they're not, you know, they're not going to, you know, harm the child or destroy the, you know, the, their, their family rhythm, but that you, you know, that you can just have a quiet, slightly conspiratorial moment with your grandchild about that. As a grandparent, your role is love, unconditional love, unconditional support. You want those grandchildren always to know that, um, you know, that their grandparents, uh, you know, have their back, okay? Okay, as a new grandmother, when you go to see your new baby, be sure to have a nice top on, okay? Because you're going to take a picture, okay? <laughs> and that's going to be the picture that is the keeper. And if you're, if you have like a diaper over your shoulder, you're going to just totally regret that. My mother always said that, like, you always pick the pictures that you look good in the babies, their faces always change the kids look, but okay. Also a, a blow dry too. Or... Uh, yes. And a good hair, okay, okay. good hair Same and a hair. nice okay. top. This okay. is, this is your moment. You are being born as a grandmother. Okay. This is, you know, you're coming out a uh, party. Today, we're really going wild. We have with us two young adults, <laughs> Nige Turner and Merck Wynn, both in their mid-20s. They were the hosts of the wildly popular podcast called Adultish. Yeah. So I'm going to sound like an old person here because you are. as a man, because I am, actually, <laughs> I am. And, um, and also because as a manager and a parent, I'm going to ask you two questions. I'm going to say one thing is as a manager, I would, and a mentor too, I would tell, this is how I would mentor people, like prioritize. And then as a manager, it's sort of like, well, wait a minute. When I say take all the time you need, I don't really mean take all the time you need. <laughs> and it's hard to find that middle ground mm -hmm. because it's just difficult. Well, I think it kind of goes with, it, it makes sense um, from what you're saying. You know, I think no matter what generation you are, you want sustainability. I think for our parents' generation, it was more sustainability meant financial stability, um, yes. being able to get a house, mm -hmm. kids, car, all those things. And I think for our generation, because our parents have worked for that and we have those things already, now when we think of sustainability, it's okay, uh, my mental health, you know, my well-being. It's, I think because we think of it like that, for us, it's not, it's not like, oh my gosh, you're going to ask a day after that because it's just kind of ingrained in our culture now. And I think it's it's changing. And so I think if you're a parent or a manager, just kind of reframing of, okay, how is this kid, how is this worker going to have the most sustainable future here with me in their life? And that's them being able to take care of themselves. And like, obviously, you want to be sure that, well, I guess if you're the person on the other side, the young person taking off that mental health day. I really hope it's for a mental health day. You're not like, oh, I'm trying to get tickets to Coachella and I need a whatever. Oh, that's I can tell you in my people. family, it's Coachella. It's not, it's not like I'm going to sit around and meditate. And, uh, yeah. But wait, Coachella, I mean, Coachella might be you prioritizing your mental health. Yeah. You might need that space to, you might need that space to just, to just let out. And then you can, right. and then you can go come back into like the work environment and be productive. I don't know. When you grow up, you just find yourself saying more and more things that your parents like oh, said and did. Yeah. Oh no, then, I become them. Oh, I know. It's so annoying. I, every time that happens, I get so just, irritated. Oh, just wait until worse. you're our age and you look in the mirror and you see them. <laughs> yeah, <it happens. laughs> like, oh my goodness. Today, we're talking about money, but in a different way. Your money, not your kids' money. We're welcoming Cameron Huddleston, an award-winning journalist with over 20 years writing on personal finance. In fact, U.S. News & World Report named her one of the top finance experts to follow on Twitter. I mean, you're right. We, don't, we all like to think that we're going to live these long, 
healthy lives. A lot of us like to, I don't know, think that we're never even going to die. <laughs> so there's no need to have these conversations. Um, but they're so important because things happened, because right. health issues happen, because death happens and we have to be prepared. I, I've been a personal finance journalist for 20 years. And so I have a, a lot of experience writing about money, but I really focused on family money conversations because of my experience with my own parents. And really because I made the mistake of not talking to them about their finances soon enough. And I don't want other people to make that same mistake. You can't wait for the emergency to have these conversations. That's not the time to have these conversations. These conversations need to happen while you are healthy so that your children can be prepared to deal with what you leave behind. Older adults are worried about talking to their kids about their will because they're afraid they're it's going to lead to fighting, you know, or their kids are going to want to know well, what exactly are they getting? Is one of them going to be getting more than the others? Well, you know what? You don't have to tell your kids what they're getting, but they need to know that you have a will and they need to know where it is and how they can access it when you die. When you're trying to talk to your kids about your finances, about your estate plan, about final wishes, you don't want to start by making the conversation about death because you're right. Your kids are afraid to think about life without you. Today, we're talking about sex, S-E-X. That's right. We've talked about money, but today it's sex. And we're talking about us, not our adult children. What happens to us and our relationships and marriages once our adult children are gone and on their own? So this is a tough topic, not one I was sure I could handle on my own. So today, joining me from behind the scenes, Connie typically does all of our tech work, but I thought she could support me on this episode. Oh, thanks, Denise. Thanks for asking me. So this will be fun. So today we are welcoming Tony and Elisa DiLorenzo. They are the hosts of the number one marriage podcast on Apple called One Extraordinary Marriage. Let's just name them so everybody's got them. So the, the six pillars are emotional, physical, financial, spiritual, recreational, and sexual. And we do separate the physical and the sexual intimacy. And that's very intentional. Oh, okay. That's right. Because you can hug and kiss, but maybe not have sexual intimacy. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. Right. Okay. 100%. And the truth of the matter is, is that you want to have strength in each one of those six pillars. And it looks different in different seasons of marriage, right? Newlyweds, those getting married in their, you know, young 20s, what their sexual intimacy looks like can look very different than a couple that's been married 40 or 50 years. It doesn't mean the sexual intimacy is any less important. It just means it changes over the time of a marriage. But you can still have great sexual intimacy. You're just going to redefine it for every season, ages and stages that you're in. I know. I, I, I can't even see the two of you, but I know that there's like a lot of blushing going on right now. <laughs> I love. Which is great. <laughs> we see marriage as something that is absolutely beautiful that we want to, for ourselves and for, for others to go, you know what? That person you said I do to on your wedding day, you had so many dreams and expectations and, and a heart beating so fast you couldn't contain it. And that first kiss, we want you to have that until your last breath, your last breath. That's what it's about. We got one opportunity to love on that person. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And sometimes we got to change our own mindset about who they are and what we are and all that sort of stuff. And it can happen. And we've seen it happen so many times that we are not going to stop cheerleading and encouraging folks. Today, Ellen and I are welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Cookson, a psychiatrist who has over 35 years of experience. A former president of the Colorado Psychiatric Society, she is board certified in general and addiction psychiatry. She's dealt with children and adults of all ages in public psychiatric settings. 
The other thing to keep in mind is there's a lot of talk about confidentiality. There's a lot of talk about HIPAA, but a concerned person can always call and give information. It's true that the person in the ER can't can't say, oh, I can't tell you whether your son is here. Well, that's okay, but if he's here, let me tell you about him. The It comes down to, are you helping, are you hurting? And that's a very difficult thing to judge sometimes. Thoughts about it have changed as well. I mean, the old 12-step AA kind of thought was they have to hit bottom. Actually, that's not supported by the research. Keeping a relationship is probably the number one thing you want to do. But you have to balance that on, is it safe? You know, people who allow their child who's not on medications, who's actively psychotic, to tear up their home, or people who allow their child to bring in lots of people who are dealing drugs in their home are not helping. On the other hand, the sort of tough love of, I'm not going to talk to you until you're clean, doesn't help either. One of the things I have find, found most helpful is a, an approach called LEAP that's uh, by a psychologist called uh, Javier Amador. He basically goes through steps about how do you talk to somebody who does not share the same belief about his or her illness as what you see and and basically sort of keeping them engaged keeping a dialogue having that be the primary thing no matter whether they're living with you or living in a group home or staying in a shelter you know just making it clear that you're always their parents no matter what We are talking once again about estate planning and money. Today, we're going to focus on what our adult kids need to do now. We're welcoming Sarah Morris. She's a legacy and estate planning attorney in Denver, Colorado. She specializes in wills, trusts, and philanthropy. There are many different scenarios that might warrant having a trust. One of which that I think is really applicable to the demographics we're talking about is if you have minor children yourself or children who have disabilities or special needs, um, even children who aren't minors yet, who are into their young adult years. A lot of parents decide to keep the um, their inheritance uh, protected in a trust for them. So some of the benefits for, for those cases are just protection from creditors of those children or from future divorcing spouses of those children. Um, they can just be a nice way to really insulate that future inheritance from the growing that young adults are going through to develop into our financial responsibility. Big three that I would recommend to 18 year olds, you know, if your kids are graduating high school and going off to college, especially they're leaving home, you really want to have those powers of attorney and you want the child to have an advanced directive, which is also referred to as a living will. People don't always realize just how extensive these types of assets have become, you know, everything from your financial account, logins for paying your bills and your loans that you want to make sure you don't fall into default, your cryptocurrency, as I mentioned, domains, digital copyrights, all of your cloud and storage accounts and your email and social media. So there's really a lot to think about here. So I usually recommend that clients compile an inventory of all of the necessary logins and passwords for that. So this is just in case someone needs to access them. You don't. Today, we're welcoming Jane Adams, PhD. Jane is the author of the book, When Our Grown Kids Disappoint Us, Letting Go of Their Problems, Loving Them Anyways, and Getting On With Our Lives. Well, first of all, let's go to blame and guilt. We are not to blame. We have nothing to be guilty about. First of all, as all the data points out, our kids from the time they start going to school are much more influenced by their peers and the peer culture than they are by us. That's not to say we don't have some influence on them. I mean, if we want them 
to be educated, we provide them with education and we make sure that they get their homework done and that they go to school and that they work as much as we're able to instill in them up to their level of ability. On the other hand, if they don't do that, if they do their hardest and then they flunk out of school or they don't get into the college that we want them to go to, it's not our fault. It's so rarely our fault. Unless, as I say, we have intentionally abused them emotionally, physically, other ways, neglected them, abandoned them, then there's some fault. And then there's a reason to feel guilt. But in most cases, as a parent, guilt is a neurotic response to having your kids not be perfect. A relatively new phenomenon, uh, historically speaking, because you know kids grew up, went to high school, and went right into the labor market. They didn't really have a young adulthood. They went from late adolescence to adulthood without any place in between. Kids today, 30 is the new 21 now. They're taking a lot longer than we did, it seems like. And that's a cultural as well as personal choice. And it's also economic and social. The same guiding posts that we had that marked adulthood, you know, graduation, real job, child, family, or family child, those don't come in the same order any longer. And some of them don't come at all. Today, we're talking about the holidays and all our adult children. We decided to break this episode into two parts. Today, we're welcoming Jane Isay, the author of the popular book, Walking on Eggshells, Navigating the Delicate Relationships Between Adult Children and Parents. She's authored several books, but this is the one that really captured our attention. A few of the chapters in the book address the stress of the holidays and adult children. So how can we as parents, we have our kids coming home, what are the kinds of things we can do to lessen that anxiety when they walk in the house? Give them the keys to your extra car. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but it's give them the opportunity to get out of the house because the house is the pressure, pressure cooker. Even though you haven't seen them for so long, you want this quality time. You'll see them. And they'll be nicer to see if they breathe a little bit, if they're not anxious. Because when they're anxious, many things can happen. But the things that come to mind are they get snippy and they get anxious and they hide in the house. So open the doors, open the windows, be happy when they are there. You'll, if you have five good minutes of conversation, you know this, you know that conversation which is, and it's usually not across the table, it's usually side by side. Cooking, walking, driving, hope for those moments. I think there's a historical reason for this. And that is that we were in charge of them when they were little. Right. And if that we criticize them, they might get in trouble. Anything we say, it's, it's through a megaphone, a megaphone of judgment. If you know that, I mean, it's just the reality. Then you, then you say, you know, I think I'll, I'll find a nicer way to say your hair is dark. So today is part two of getting ready for the holidays. We're having Ginny Jones, who authored the article, Why Adult Kids Don't Come Home for the Holidays. Ginny is a parenting coach, but she also specializes in helping parents navigate eating disorders, recovery, and other food and body related issues. We'll touch on that a bit, since that can be an issue with all the sweets and treats during the holidays. Relationships are dances, right? We are dancing the same steps. And if the parent-child relationship doesn't evolve as we grow, then we just keep dancing the same dance. I guess what I think is most important to know is that relationships are never one-sided. One person doesn't control the dance. The dance is two people engaging in a pattern or a habitual relationship. Our kids are born with you know, very immature nervous systems and they actually grow up in response to our nervous system. This is all the amazing stuff we're learning in neuroscience right now. So what it means is that our kids are actually so tuned in to our nervous system 
that one of the best things we can do to have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with our adult kids is to learn to regulate our own nervous system. What that means is if you're afraid for your kid, and by the way, criticism and judgment comes from fear. What are you afraid of for your child? And then how do we practice trusting that our child's life is their life? Their body is their body. Their choices are their choices. We're here to love them, accept them, support them, but it's not ours. You come home and you have all these thoughts about like, okay, I'm going to be with my family. I'm going to belong. Most people who have eating disorders don't feel like they belong. So when I focus on the food and what they're eating or how they're eating, I'm missing an opportunity to connect. So that's a wrap for season one. It's been so much fun. What a journey, I have to say. We hope this mashup was fun for you, and it reminded you of some of your favorite episodes, and also that you remembered some of those pearls of wisdoms our guest offered this first season. A huge thank you to all of you for listening. Knowing that you're listening and getting value from the podcast gives us energy, amazing energy, to keep going. There are so many podcasts to choose from, so we're very happy you're listening to Bite Your Tongue. Now, please do us a favor and share the podcast with a friend. You really can help build our audience. Also, if you haven't done so yourself, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode. And finally, visit our website, biteyourtonguepodcast.com. There's easy links to every single episode on that website. And frankly, we can all use refreshers. Now hold on to your seat because we have amazing guests lined up already for season two. You will want to mark your calendars for January 7th when our first episode of season two drops. We are beyond excited about what's to come, truly. Now finally, enjoy the holidays. Say goodbye to 2021. Enjoy time with your family, friends, and hopefully your adult children. But remember, sometimes you may just have to bite your tongue.